Hi, so um, I'm actually gonna cover far more than just goose hollow, um, uh, but a hollow is an old fashioned word that was a ravine, a gulch. Hollows in place names in American history are quite often derogatory. Um, and Goose Hollow was named as such, that's a whole different talk that I give, uh, for the crazy immigrant ladies who lived down near Tanner Creek who let their geese run wild. And when the neighbors complained and the, the police chief sent out someone to deal with that, um, they were angry at how he divided up the flock to send them home and they assaulted the police officer who was responding. So the police chief coined the phrase Goose Hollow, and it does imply those crazy immigrant ladies down in the gulch. Um, so that would be about four blocks from here. So if you ever wondered why Goose Hollow. But what most people don't know, as you walk through Portland, you are often walking over um, about 50 to 20 feet of fill um, in Northwest Portland, from about Raleigh to, or uh, Lovejoy to Raleigh, uh, right here where we're standing right now. Um, uh, they're uh, on the corner where Zion Lutheran is. They talk in their oral histories for their uh, church about standing on the edge of a cliff and looking down into the gulch and seeing Tanner Creek down below. And so the reason I started on this exploration was on my first book, oops, sorry, my paper isn't working. On my first book, uh, Portland's Goose Hollow, here. Um, I started wondering about how Goose Hollow got its name, about what was happening in the Gulch. Um, how did, in 1870, practically a third of old Portland, old Portland is from the river to the hills. That's all Portland was. So most of Lincoln's feeder area is what was then old Portland. How, how did it change its name? And then as I started realizing that um, history is written by the people who are marketing their city. They write about what they're proud of. In the history books, I wasn't finding good mentions about the people who immigrated, the people who were uh, forcibly removed. I wasn't finding these stories. So today you can go onto um, the or uh, University of Oregon and Oregon State University have um, collectively um, digitized newspapers in Oregon. It's an incredible resource. So for about a year and a half, my, my kids were small, and so I, I would research after I put them to bed, and so from 8 p.m. to midnight researching, I could do a keyword search for the Oregonian as it was written and, and, and looking at stories in the 1860s on up. I've literally read every mention of Indian or Injun or other uh, racial slurs. I looked for anything I could to try to pull up a story that was hidden. I looked for Chinese, Chinese vegetable gardens, Chinese gardens. I looked for celestial, which was a way of referring to Chinese people at the time um, as uh, referring to the celestial kingdom. So what started happening is that as I pulled up these newspaper stories that were written at that time, I began to see a completely different version of Portland history a lot was left out. And the people that were proudest of the streets that mostly white men were named after were not proud of these stories. I'm very proud of these stories and that's why I tell them. Um, the second book, I, I'm co-author on Portland Slabtown. All of Northwest Portland from the river to the hills was called Slabtown. So it's now just a smaller section from Lovejoy North, but at the time that's what it was called. So my part of the research in there was focused on the buried creeks, gulches, and lakes of old Northwest Portland, and the Chinese vegetable gardens, and I discovered Native American people living right alongside the Chinese vegetable farmers. Uh, the next one um, is my only academic book. I'm an academic, but I write photo histories because more people read them, and I want more people to read those histories. Um, so the next one is by uh, my uh, co-authored with my daughter, Zadie Schaefer, who graduated from here two years ago and is at college right now. And we loved working on Notable Women of Portland at a time when women's rights were being stripped away in a pretty profound way. It felt like we were resetting the karma in the universe in a way. Um, if you wanna follow me, um, I'm um, on Twitter, um, Facebook, Instagram, etc. So let's look at this illustrated map 
showing the terrain of old Portland. So it's showing you where it's gulchier, where there are lakes. Um, there were four lakes in Northwest Portland. There were, um, Giles was down here. It's very, it's depicted as pretty low. All of these were fed by the creeks and then they overflowed into the Willamette. So God's Lake was where Old Town Chinatown, the Pearl sit today. It was fed by uh, Tanner Creek and Johnson Creek. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. This is Giles Lake. And then there was Kittredge's and Doan's Lake right off the frame. Parts of Kittredge's and Doan's Lake still exist. As you're driving towards St. John's Bridge, you can see bodies of water out there, heavily polluted. So a friend of mine is an amateur map maker, and he said, I can take that map and I can overlay it on, a, on a, an, er, a, another map. And so this is from about the 1920s, I think, and he overlaid. So this is a great illustration. Anywhere you see the stars, there were Chinese vegetable gardens. So this appears in um, my, the Slabtown book. So Tanner Creek Gulch was huge. It was 20 blocks long, 50 feet deep. It was a huge gulch that cut right through here. We're sitting in Tanner Creek Gulch right now. And um, uh, the, uh, it was started as a tannery, which was one of the first things built this far out on the far edge of town. Um, the other one was Johnson Creek. It wasn't confusing that there was a Johnson Creek on the east side because they were not, they were two separate cities. So we have a Johnson Creek that's still flowing. If you go down Burnside and you go into the forest, Johnson Creek is flowing on either. It starts on one side by Pittock Mansion and then they divert it underground and then it flows on the next side. So it's absolutely fascinating. The hidden hydrology, you're gonna get a talk later about that. But this is a gulch that almost everybody forgot about. They seem to remember Tanner Creek Gulch. And by the way, the only time you can feel it today is if you're sitting in the stadium because that's a natural amphitheater carved out by the Tanner Creek. But what they didn't realize was over here in Northwest Portland was Johnson Creek Gulch. In that gulch was a Chinese vegetable garden and there were Native American encampments nearby. And here, the Native American encampment was about right there. And I suspected that the Native American encampment was there. So I took a, an 1879 uh, illustration of the growing city of Portland. As you can see, it's starting to get some activity happening on the east side. And I just drew over it Goose Hollow's current boundaries because most people have no idea where that is. That's from Burnside to the low slopes of the West Hills and from I-405 up to Washington Park. I also put the place names that people have forgotten. Gander Ridge, Cable Car Canyon, where there was a cable car, uh, Vista Ridge, Tanner Creek Canyon, where Tanner Creek ran, where the zoo runs today, Kings Hill, and we are sitting right here. So uh, where we were was, oh, no, sorry, we're not right there. We're right here. That's 18th and Jefferson. So the hollow, the deep hollow begins at 18th and Jefferson, and Lincoln High School is about right here. The stadium sits here. You can see that Alder and Burnside are completely on 50 foot tall bridges as it goes through this area. So zooming in so you can see the bridges over Alder and Burnside, it still has that funky triangle configuration on that. Um, so sorry, what I wanted to, oops, sorry. what I wanted to focus on is what's happening in the gulch or in Goose Hollow. So in this hollow, um, there's the old Portland High School. It was um, built in 1885, demolished in 1929. We are sitting off frame about right here. This is the next, the next street over, which is Taylor. And everywhere you see a building built into the floodplain of a creek, then you know it would be called a Chinese shanty. On the Sanborn insurance maps that were these carefully detailed maps that showed every little uh, building every little lean-to shack. They, they labeled them clearly Chinese shanties. But after a while, I got to the point where I could figure it out even if it wasn't labeled because uh, people who are severely disadvantaged have very few opportunities for jobs in life or restricted from many jobs. The Chinese vegetable farmers were all men because many women were uh, forbidden to immigrate at that time 
were doing some of the few things they could do, making a living the best they could, working so hard and getting bumper crops of vegetables off of that land. So they would plant in the floodplain. This is Tanner Creek, you can't see, you can only see the plank crossing the creek, right here and right here. Knowing full well that they would be flooded out two or three times a year, and knowing that they would need to go in and rebuild, uh, replant, it was um, just taking advantage of wh wherever they could make a living. Um, you can see the, the lines of the vegetable farms. This was considered undesirable land. So this is looking, if you're standing on 18th at the stadium and looking up Kings Hill. So where the Mac sits today were these um, Chinese shanties that sat at the top of the hill. There might have been 15 men living in one house. And Tanner Creek runs at the base of Kings Hill and back in, over here and then this way. There's a man planting right there or working his land. And this is just a slightly different version of this. This was a popular postcard of the day. John Reed, who, uh -huh. Should I turn down the lights? Oh, that'd be great, yes. Uh, John Reed, who uh, wrote about the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, he lived in his grandfather's mansion up the hill, and he wrote about his time in Portland and wrote about passing from the grand mansions down through the Chinese vegetable gardens and going to school. Um, so this, what, this is, um, on, I was a consulting historian for um, the stadium when they remodeled it, and I begged them to, to put a picture up. And th so right now that is on 18th and you can see that. So in all instances for both Native American and Chinese American stories, I tried to get photos in Portland, not just a generic photo, who knows where it is in Portland, so that people could see how prevalent the story is, how much a part interwoven with the life of the city this was. So this is a photo in Portland and it's handwritten across the top, vegetable vendor. This was such a common sight in old Portland that tourists would write into the Oregonian and say, um, sorry, is there? No, those are the light switch. Is that it? Okay. There we go. So tour tourists would write into the Oregonian and say, um, oh, it was amazing to be in Portland and see so many vegetable vendors around the town. So uh, the men would walk with a pole across their shoulders and uh, baskets ha hanging down on each side. They would take the vegetables they had grown and sell them door to door. Uh, they would offer to haul the laundry from the houses they were selling to, to the nearest Chinese laundry, or they would go into the hillside and chop down a tree and sell kindling. They were very industrious people trying to make a living the best they could. So this is a picture that I have included in the Portland Slab Town book. So you can see here in Northwest Portland is a picture of a, a, a vendor who's selling the, his firewood. And this is at Guild's Lake. This is an amazing photo showing probably a Chinese vegetable farmer who's gone over to Guild's Lake, which was in Northwest Portland. It's all completely infilled today. We would call it the industrial area. But he's fishing in Giles Lake. This is right at the Kings Hill Max stop. So this is a really important image for Lincoln High School and for this neighborhood and for Portland history. And I was so excited to find this and I was, you know, you get used to seeing what the buildings are in the background and you can try to figure out where you are. So to me, this is so important to find uh, that story and tell the story through images in a way that can make it come alive for us, not just a map or not just a quote from a newspaper. So a friend of mine collects historical photos. He loaned me hundreds and hundreds of images for all three of my books, and he sent this to me. And in every one of them, I zoomed in hoping to see geese in Goose Hollow. And I never did, but <laughs> I did find something here. And I want you to focus in. This is the corner of 19th and Burnside. So this is a Chinese American man walking down the street in probably 1905-ish. You can see how deep the gulch is behind this building that was built where the civic um, condos are today. Uh -huh. 1905 was the year of the Lewis and Clark Exposition. Mm -hmm. Which, no, so, but this wasn't part of the 
What was the 1892? That was a different position, or have you gone into that? Oh, no, no, you're right, you're right. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going off when the building burned. So, yeah, it's, it's 1892. Sorry, you're right, absolutely right. So, um, this building was an, an exposition building that was built to host presidential visits, uh, football or uh, basketball games, the early precursors to the Rose Festival, things like that. And so this was just amazing to me to see just walking down Burnside, the normal process of life in Portland. So why, where did the, Ch the Chinese vegetable gardens go? Well, they were all on the outskirts of town, the suburbs as they used to call them. And then as that land became more and more desirable and more built up, um, they, they, the land that was considered undesirable or useless and could be farmed out by the Chinese vegetable farmers was, was put into more real estate use. But there was also uh, the bearing of Tanner Creek and all the creeks um, that fed into the lakes of old Portland. Um, so uh, this is uh, Tanner Creek being buried. It was buried from the 1890s to about 1920s and it flowed um, from uh, what is near the Tanner Springs Park in the Pearl District that is not where Tanner Creek flows today. That is an homage to the wetlands. It's not the exact spot. But it was um, buried from there all the way down uh, what is now 18th and then flowed under the Vista Bridge and out towards, if you're driving on Highway 26 by the zoo, you're driving right over the top of Tanner Creek that's still buried under there. It's still doing its job. In my book, I called it a culvert. I did not call it a sewer because it's carrying living water. It's not carrying, um, you know, spoiled water. Um, the bottom was built with basalt that was used for um, uh, the ships that came in as a, a balance. And so it, people who work in the sewer department have told me they've gone inside and they say it's quite um, strong. So what was amazing to me was to see the people working on it, and there's what we would consider today their Sunday best was very interesting. So the Johnson Creek Gulch. So this picture is around uh, 24th and Lovejoy. So if you can imagine where Lovejoy starts to go up the hill. So this woman is standing and looking over the gulch. In the distance is Giles Lake, which is now completely infilled. So it was 14 blocks long, four to five blocks wide in places. Johnson Creek was buried around 1889, and uh, the maps show 20 to 30 foot bridges crossing it. It was filled with sluice dirt, trash, and sawdust. So this was their method of taking care of what they considered a nuisance. So a creek uh, would overflow uh, uh, in, a, in a heavy rain. It would pull lots of mud and rocks and sticks down the creek. That would cause it to overflow. It would flood out people several blocks around. And they thought, well, the best thing to do is bury it. So that's why a lot of the Chinese vegetable gardens went away is because the creeks that they relied on and the gulches they were in, the creeks were piped underground and the gulches were infilled. This is the Northwest Thurman Street Bridge. So if you've ever hiked the Bulch Creek Trail that connects to the Wildwood Trail, mm -hmm. you are walking right over uh, the path of Chinese vegetable gardens. So uh, this is underneath the bridge, Bulch Creek used to flow all the way to Giles Lake and now it's piped underground. And these, again, as you can see, the Chinese shanties as they're marked on the Sanborn insurance maps built right into the floodplain of Bulch Creek. And that's a uh, very rich fertile land, but the, they'd also have to rebuild. And this is Giles Lake and this was a known site for more Chinese vegetable gardens, but also what they called Chinese ranches. So I think the distinction is they were raising, uh, you know, uh, animals and that sort of thing where maybe they weren't on the Chinese vegetable gardens. And in this area, there were Native American um, encampments. I'll get to, I, I decided to tell the Chinese American story first, and then I'll get to the Native American. So what displaces all of these I haven't added up the acres, but I would think 100 acres of Chinese vegetable gardens on the inner west side. What displaces them is progress and is uh, the land being repurposed for other things. And uh, uh, the part of the progress was taking Giles Lake, 
and creating the exposition, the Lewis and Clark Exposition in 1905 to honor the 100 year anniversary of Lewis and Clark's adventure. Um, and so it completely reshaped the topography, it used the lake for boat trips for tourists, but after the exposition, it, for about 10 years, they were uh, wondering what to do with it, and eventually they built giant sluices to level the hillside for uh, building the lots on the hills. And they sluiced the dirt down to fill in Gouds Lake. So these things were considered undesirable and need to get rid of them. So let's move to the Native American story. So where Portland stands today are the historic homelands of several bands of Chinook speaking people, including the Multnomah, the Clackamas, the Watlata or the Cascades villages. But they were also um, Kalapuya people. Uh, a Tualatin is a band. So a band is a smaller group of a, um, uh, a larger tribe. So the Tualatin uh, people were part of the Kalapuya. They were a band. We should be calling them the Tualatin Mountains. That's what their official name is. Here in Portland, we say the West Hills. Mm -hmm. But they are the Tualatin Mountains and they're named after the Tualatin Kalapuya people. So um, I have images to show you that of early explorers, when, they, when uh, anybody took a, a boat to be adventurers, explorers, you know, to try to check out the land for Britain or, any, or Spain, they took illustrators with them. Because in the, before the era of photography, they took illustrators. So these are um, important illustrations so it, showing <coughs> Native American life around Portland in 1841 by the Charles Wilkes Expedition. And this is at Oregon City at the Willamette Falls, which were important site of harvesting. And this uh, uh, is uh, with Mount Hood in the background. James Swan lived among the Chinook people in the 1840s and then wrote about that later and drew illustrations of the Chinook plank houses. So although we don't have an illustration of what a Chinook plank house looked like in Portland, we have similar Chinook styles illustrated up and down the Columbia. So this is a typical Chinook style plank house. And in the Chinook tradition, it's hard to tell here, but their foreheads were slightly flattened. So that was a common um, tradition. This shows you um, uh, before 1805, uh, where you would find different language groups and tribal people. So you can see that where we sit in Portland, right around here was Chinook people. So the Chinook people went far down the Columbia, all the way up to um, Astoria, but they were not one collective tribe who only acted independently. They were different villages that were somewhat independent. So when you hear about the Chinook Nation in Washington that's trying to gain federal recognition, that's a different group of Chinook people. They were not the Chinook people who were here in Portland. Um, but it just shows you um, the different language groups um, before uh, European colonization. Um, so uh, the Chinook, this is an illustration by George Catlin in 1841 showing uh, Chinook people fishing. And we see the flattened um, foreheads. Uh, this is a cradle board where the baby's gentle pressure is, was put on the baby's forehead to uh, create that shape which was considered desirable. This is a map of Lewis and Clark of Sovi Island which in their journal is marked as Wapato Island. So we can see where native people were by the triangles that they drew. So everywhere there's a triangle and this is where you land at the Portland airport. You see how many triangles are there? They should have done a lot of archeological digging before they put an airport there is what I'm saying. That's a massive village. So we get a sense of how many villages were there on Wapato Island, do you see where it says Wapato Island? Mm -hmm. Those were almost exclusively the Multnomah um, band of the Chinook people. Wapato was a starchy, tu or is a starchy tuber that was used for food. I have a picture of it. So um, we see the Wapato and the Camas, Wapato and Camas. Um, and both of them are bulbs that are 
the, uh, the women would take uh, kind of a pointed stick and dig up from uh, usually wetlands. And apparently the wapato tasted a bit like a potato and the camas tasted a bit sweeter. Um, so uh, this is a story from James Swan's uh, 1950s um, book, uh, or 1850s, uh, talking about how important the wapato is. Wapato grew incredibly well here in, in the Portland region. Um, it grew so well that um, when Sacagawea, who was on the Lewis and Clark expedition and did everything they did, but with a baby on her back and also interpreting and cooking and sewing and guiding, um, when she was asked, uh, they asked the group to vote on where they should winter. And she voted for going, they were in Astoria. She voted for coming back to Portland, what is now Portland, uh, because the Wapato grew better there and that would be a more stable food source during the winter. She was outvoted, but they stayed in Astoria. But, um, so this is a map put out by the state of Oregon that shows you where the nine federally recognized tribes are today in Oregon. So there was the first great cultural decimation was when all of the tribal people, pe people who were in Oregon were forced, they all had their own individual trails of tears. They were forced marched into a nearby reservation. Um, they were, um, the treaties were signed that would uh, give the entire rights to the Willamette Valley away. Um, but, you know, it was in suspicious circumstances sometimes. Um, so that was an incredibly huge cultural decimation. Um, so people were put into tribes where they may have been historic enemies, where they didn't speak the same language. There are over 30 different tribal groups that were put onto the Grand Ron and also on the Siletz. And they may have ranged from northern, or Southern Washington to Northern California, could not speak the language. So this um, uh, helped the rise of Chinook jargon as a standardized language among um, the native peoples of Oregon. It's, it, I'll talk, talk a little bit more about that. But there's a second great cultural decimation that um, people don't talk about that much, and that is in the 1950s, 109 tribes were terminated by the federal government. The federal government said, you do not exist. It was a budget saving effort. And so it was trying to, um, you know, take smaller tribes or for, so for example, if the federal government needs to provide a school, at least a nurse, um, you know, some, some benefits that are very basic for survival, then they wouldn't have to pay it for those 109 tribes. So in Oregon, there's only two tribes who stayed intact from their treaties. And that is the Warm Springs of the 1855 and the Confederated Tribes of Umatilla. Almost all the tribes in Oregon are Confederated tribes, meaning that there are several different tribal groups who came together. So from there on out, they had to fight their way back to federal recognition. So just so you know, when people say, well, who was in Portland? I'll, I'll tell you a little more about that. They were Chinook people who had villages here, but this was also a site of trade that was very important. So I like this illustration from the 1841 Charles Wilkes expedition because it's actually labeled Indian Baskets of Oregon. So um, to me, it, it, you could still line up a picture of baskets and still say that. The designs are quite accurate. They're, they're commonly used throughout uh, Oregon tribes. Basketry is a huge um, method of expressing artistic um, individuality and cultural expression for Native peoples. Um, I do want to talk about the use of the word Indian, Native, Native American, and Indigenous just very quickly. That's a whole nother lecture. So if you are in Indian country, as I am frequently, um, everybody says Indian. Um, they call it Indian country. Um, but I feel like it's more respectful when you're not in Indian country to say Native or Native American. I personally don't use the word indigenous that much because which indigenous people are you talking about? Are you talking about the Sami people who are the indigenous people in the Scandinavian countries? Are you talking about Aboriginal people in Aus Australia? So for me, I want to get a little more, more specific and say Native American. So just to clarify um, the use of the terms. Oh, sorry. Um, so this is a great illustration showing how Native American women would go into the forest 
and cut one strip of bark from a cedar tree and pull that strip off so that it wouldn't kill the tree. So um, I know about, um, this is a, a indigenously marked tree, a culturally marked tree. There's one way on the outskirts of, of Forest Park that um, is, I just, I feel like it's a spiritual moment when I'm sitting there and I see what's about probably 150 to 200 year old scar on that tree. So they're definitely doing that here in Portland. They're finding the materials to weave the baskets. Cedar is practically waterproof when woven into a cap, a cape, a skirt, or a basket. They would literally cook soup in the basket. So they would take hot stones in, from a fire, they put stones in a fire, get the hot stones heated up, and then put that in water <laughs> in um, uh, a basket and you know cook, cook acorn soup or other things. Um, so this was an incredibly important part of the cultural lifeways in Oregon, all throughout the Northwest Coast. So this is an illustration of Fort Vancouver. Changes occur when um, the British come in, they want to uh, be, have a preeminent position here. We're, we could have easily been in Canada right now if the negotiations and arguments had gone a different way. Um, and there was tons of trading with native people there. From The native people came from all over. So the Hudson Bay Company um, hired an, an artist who went from fort to fort all across Canada and then down to the Fort Vancouver. Um, he went back to his home in Ontario and then sold his illustrations and paintings for the rest of his life. But um, here he wrote, he painted quite um, thoughtfully and, and painted things that perhaps other people would have overlooked. So this is the interior of a plank lodge, a Chinook um, house. The house would have held maybe up to 10 families. There's a little child peeking out over this elevated sleeping area. And this was a fire pit in the center with a hole um, cut in the ceiling for the, the smoke to escape. This is that James Swan illustration I showed you earlier. And I wanted to zoom in here. This is a very classical Chinook canoe used by many different tribes, but the Chinook people were very well known for it. So on the Willamette River and the Columbia River, that's what you would have seen tons of. And this is drawn in the James Swan book. Another mention of, you know, he spells it Chinook canoe. And if you want to go visit one, this is a historically accurate um, recreation. Um, I'm getting the sun in my face. Um, historically accurate recreation of a plank house in Ridgefield, Washington. It's about a 35 minute drive from here. And it's absolutely spectacular. The Chinook Nation uses it for ceremonial purposes. And there's, you can't see because we're looking at the other end of that canoe, but that's a Chinook canoe with that animal effigy prow. So this is an 1880s image uh, showing Cooch Lake. You can see even then what we now, what we call um, Old Town Chinatown and um, the Pearl District completely covered by water. Mm. So um, some of the architects I've talked to have said that when they build the condos and apartments in the Pearl District, they have to build it basically like in a bathtub because the water table is still there. So on a really rainy day, it's gonna be very, a lot of water flowing through the bottom levels of the buried parking. The water table doesn't go away just because you put a bunch of dirt and sawdust there. So this is just a fascinating article, one of the many I found um, I about fell over when I read this. At that time, there were only 275 men, women, and children in Portland, and there were fully 1,000 Indians. So first of all, you know, they're of course talking about mostly white pioneers, although there were black pioneers as well. Um, but to me, reading about 1850s Portland and reading that native people outnumbered white people four to one is pretty stunning. And that is not taught in our history books. And so this is a really important thing to start thinking about. Just because there were cultural decimations doesn't mean that native people went away and were never seen again. They were seen constantly in Portland. Um, so 500 them, of them camped at the foot of Jefferson Street near our home and 500 more camped at Cooch's Landing on Cooch Lake, 
where Portland's Union Station now stands. They were peaceable and never gave us worry or trouble. So this was reprinted in 1975 from an earlier um, interview. So when an, an eyewitness account of a, a white pioneer who was here is saying this, it's really an important bit of information to, so I'm, I started then looking for evidence. So I wanna show you where the foot of Jefferson is. So if you go to the Blues Festival, this natural amphitheater where it's carved out is at the foot of Jefferson. There's Jefferson right there. So that's from there till about the Tillicum Bridge is where a, a, a huge encampment of 500 people were. And um, I advocated for, uh, the Grand Ronde tribe advocated as well for the Tillicum Bridge to be named that because I wanted that native history to be acknowledged and it's literally, I'm sure it covered there because you can't, 500 people take up a whole lot of space. Tillicum means the people. So it fits the bridge because it's about moving as many people as possible, but it also fits the people of this region. And we Portlanders, I've lived in many other places, almost everybody does a better job than we do of telling our native history. So we need more public art and that sort of thing. So this is from Oregonian, the Tualatin Indians and other nearby districts were, uh, were peaceful and they made visits to town. Their favorite encampment was on the shore of Cooch Lake. So just giving you, how did I come up with the evidence? I'm trying to show you my research to show you where I, I got this from. So this was printed, uh, this Chinook Jargon Dictionary was printed here in Portland. It's in its 11th edition in 1887. You could not live in Oregon up until about the 1880s without knowing Chinook Jargon. Mm -hmm. They used the word jargon and it was not derogatory. They were very proud of speaking it. The native people called it the Wawa. So, the Grand Ron has put out a dictionary called Chinook Wawa. Um, so it, it isn't derogatory to call it the jargon. And I've interviewed old pioneer families who still use Chinook jargon in their families. So if you've ever heard the term uh, muckety muck, please raise your hand. Okay, you are using a Chinook jargon word that has entered the English language widely. It would mean the chief with the most food. So the chief with the most food would be the richest. So if we say the muckety mucks on the West Hills, we're talking about people who may be a little too impressed with how much money they have. Um, so um, it's a word that is used all over the world. So this Chinook jargon has entered the English language so widely. It was made up of trade words largely from the Chinook people that we'll hear around Portland or all, all up and down the Columbia River and the Willamette from English words, French words, and from other loan words from other native languages up and down the Northwest coast. It was used from Northern California all the way to the Yukon territories, and it was a common trade language, probably in use before any European contact, so without the English words. So um, over here, this is a great quote um, from uh, a history of the region. Immigrants, so they mean pioneers or other uh, people coming into the area learned the Chinook language from the Indians and it seemed the most outlandish talk that I had ever heard. It was often used in the families of white people more than their own language. We could buy from the Indians a salmon weighing from 20 to 30 pounds for almost anything that we had to give in old clothing or if we had money, uh, any money, 25 cents. Why would uh, clothing be desirable? Mm -hmm. Go. Maybe they had no cotton to weave fabric out of. Well, did you remember the image of the woman stripping a bark of cedar off the tree? Think of how much labor goes into weaving a shirt, a, a shawl, which was the common uh, thing to have. So the, it was a labor saving thing. If you give me a shirt, I'll give you a salmon. So it was a barter system that worked. It, the native people thought it was a, incredibly valuable. So. I won't read this whole article, but this is a this was it just about knocked me over because it describes two native women passing through town. There's some derogatory language here. You have to read through some of this stuff in order to get to the history, which is they are sp speaking Chinook jargon with Chinese men who were in the vegetable gardens. And so to me, it was so fascinating to think of these two groups that were not even written about in the history book that much and excluded and not part of what is considered 
you know, worthy to write about in Portland. And they're speaking Chinook jargon to each other. They're, in other stories I found, they're trading on a daily basis between each other. Um, the uh, Chinese farmer in Northwest Portland goes and takes vegetables over to the um, Native American encampment nearby and trades the vegetables for fish or for a basket. It was a, a, it was a, um, a daily interaction and lots of um, uh, people working together. Sorry, I have to read it from here. Um, this is about an article in 18, about uh, 1845. They perform a great deal of work for the whites and where labor is so scarce as it is here, there is no slight assistance to the settlements. Many of them make very good hired hands and they are found particularly useful in rowing boats, paddling canoes, herding cattle, and in menial operations which require a sort of refuse labor, if such a term can be used, and it would be dear at the outlay of a valuable settler's time. You can hire a Chinook for work upon a farm for a week with, with for a shirt worth 83 cents. So again, derogatory, you know, like, oh yeah, they'll work for anything kind of language. We're gonna, we're gonna have to wade through some of that to get to the story that's been left out. But what it shows me is a, a fascinating economy that relies on uh, daily interactions with native people at a time when almost every Oregon history book, even to this day, begins with um, a manifest destiny version of history. You know, they don't start with 10,000 years of native history and they, they act as if native people just went away and then they were never seen again. So that's why the Notable Women of Portland book that my daughter and I wrote, uh, it starts with 10,000 years of native history. It assumes a multiculture here in, in Oregon. Um, we purchased of the Indians ducks, geese, swans, salmon, potatoes, feathers, and venison for little or nothing. Ducks, four loads. Feathers cost about 12 and a half cents a pound. There are more ducks, etc., here than you ever saw. Also, pheasants in great numbers. They remain here all the winter. I have hunted very little, being too busy. We find it very profitable to get of the Indians, to whom we trade old shirts, pantaloons, vests, and all sorts of clothing. They are more anxious to purchase clothes than any people you ever saw. You can sell anything here that ever was sold. That's 1844 and Linton, which is a, a neighborhood in Portland. So we're getting a glimpse of the daily interaction and native people didn't go away. And what are they trading for? So one, there are fascinating um, articles that I found in advertisements that were like, we've got trade beads, come get them. So this is talking about the clipper ships arriving and they have 20,000 pounds of Indian trade beads and just the color that they like here and that would be blue. So. At that time, um, transportation routes weren't fully established then. The boom of steamboat building occurred in the mid 1850s and roads were non-existent or mud. So those 20,000 pounds of beads were likely headed to be used mostly in Portland. So to me, that tells me what a robust uh, uh, bartering and trade system there was. So we're gonna go back over to Johnson Creek. Uh, as you can see, Johnson Creek Gulch, um, so it goes up into, that woman was standing about right here as they head up into the hill, probably around Cornell Road. So in the Slabtown book, I again went digging. I wanted to find native stories, Chinese American stories. And it was amazing that um, I found about um, Native American bands living in the outskirts of town in Johnson Creek Gulch. Um, it was a favorite camping ground. Um, and this guy lives right next door to them and is talking about that. And this is a long description where he's talking about the Native American campground that's right next to his, his family's land um, in Northwest Portland. And they are camping in Johnson Creek Gulch and he describes 25 or right here, 25 or 30 wigwams and a sweat house was a sod built hut or dugout, heated and filled with steam by dropping hot stones. And when the Indians were ill, they would go into it, perspire freely, and plunge into the ice cold creek. So remember, I told you about Johnson Creek being buried? So that's the creek they were jumping into, and the Johnson Creek Gulch was what they were living in. And this was more of a permanent settlement. It wasn't like temporary, I'm going to camp for three or four months. So 
Native American families, even when they were forced onto the reservation, would come into Portland for three or four months, mostly in the summer, to trade the baskets that the women had made, to trade for uh, huckleberries, salmon, um, firewood, many different things but for both the Chinese Americans and for the white and many um, ethnicities um, settlers living nearby. This image is of a native family in Oregon. I'm not entirely sure it's in Portland. So uh, there is also evidence that there was a Native American um, um, encampment in Goose Hollow in the Tanner Creek Gulch. And this is remembering back when they lived at 17th and Alder. So that would put them just a block away from the Chinese vegetable gardens. So there was constant commerce and interaction. This is another um, Native American family um, possibly in Portland um, and coming in for a, a three-month encampment. Now this has a very terrible um, racial slur which is, um, I, I, I'm sorry to, to expose you to this but this is how we get to find the story and to understand what's happening. When I'm just gonna say women, I'm not gonna say that word out loud. When women peddled wild berries or olalas from house to house. Olalas is a Chinook jargon word for berries. Um, when thrifty women sold pitchwood kindling or legume stick to provident housewives for fire lighters. Legume stick means a pitch, pitchwood that has, is ready to start a fire. So the, the writers are using Chinook jargon as they're remembering back in the olden days. Um, these images were taken in Portland. So again, I'm trying to find images. The Native American images were almost impossible to find. I did my best. But um, this woman, um, I, I didn't know it at the time my Goose Hollow book came out, but I do believe she's a, Chin a Chinook woman, a grandmother with her grandchild, uh, because of the way the beading looks on the cradle board. Um, and this is later one uh, later taken at the Dalles that I compared the beadwork to and the striping of uh, around them. This is an Edward Curtis photo from 1900, and it shows a Chinook family group who are going down the Columbia River. So I'm showing you this to show you they didn't go away. They were still here. This was still a common sight around old Portland. And what do you see here? Do you start to recognize the shape? of the Chinook canoes. This is a 1904 Oregonian illustration, and it's not about the native people in the story. I just saw it in the bottom of an illustration. It's about the harbor is so busy. We have so many ships coming in, and they're helping unload the ship. So just casually, they throw in a Chinook canoe uh, that's helping unload a ship in the har harbor, lightering freight from the steam to the shore. I guess lifting. So from about um, 1890 to about 1930, where Chapman Elementary School and Wallace Park, my kids went to Chapman Elementary School, they played every day after, during recess at Wallace Park. That park was the site of about 40 years of encampments, of, of um, seasonal encampments for Native people coming in from many different tribes to uh, barter, to sell their wares. Um, Five Indian tents are pitched in a grove near Savior Street, which has been used by the same Indians for many years from the Celeste Reservation. They dispose of baskets and knickknacks, which the women have made during the winter. So I put a map here for you in case you don't know where that is. That's in Northwest Portland. Here's Chapman Elementary where the Swifts come out of the chimney. And um, I wanna show you that right around here is where that woman was standing looking out over the gulch so that you can see all of this was gulch. Mm -hmm. So what was fascinating to me is even though this gulch was infilled, Johnson Creek Gulch was infilled, they kept returning like a cultural memory to very close to that over and over for decades. In those times, Indians came to Portland to trade. The, squaw the sorry, women rode on their ponies carrying great loads of huckleberries in baskets. They traded for old clothing. This was the time for my mother to dispense of the dresses and sunbonnets we wore on the plains, so in the covered wagons. Before we st started west, she brought, bought the heavy, heaviest ginghams to wear on the long journey, and she was keeping them for relics of our journey. They were faded to a dingy brown. 
So these were very valuable. They were nice and warm. And so this would have been a, a valuable trade item for the native people. This is an incredibly striking image. One of my favorites of any book. Um, every one of my books are photo histories. They all have over 200 images in it. And this is my favorite image of all of them. That these baskets are click a tap baskets. They were called that because of the design. And click a tap people were forced onto the Yakima reservation in Washington, but people from the entire region wove in the click a tap basket style, but that's what it was called. So Chinook people wove in the click a tap basket style. Um, uh, the different groups did. This picture is taken in Northwest Portland. And my friend who co-authored this lab time book with me, we looked, we tried to identify the exact house and we couldn't, but it's the exact same vernacular architecture. And we know from the set of pictures it was uh, found with, that it was found with Northwest Portland images. So to me, these are quintessential um, Oregon basketry designs, and they show incredible skill and artistry by the native women in that um, image. So almost done, I just wanted to give you, so I've collapsed about four different talks here today. <laughs> uh, the buried creeks and gulches of old Portland, uh, Native Americans of old Portland, Chinese vegetable gardens of old Portland, and um, Native American art of Oregon. Those are some of my specialties. So I wanted to give you some visual images since you're thinking about visual images you'd like to see on the mural of the types of native art that would have been here in Portland and here on in old Portland. So um, we did not have totem poles here in Oregon um, at the moment of settler or a European interaction, uh, there would have been no totem poles. So that is way Northern Washington, parts of Alaska and British Columbia. But somehow or another, totem poles become collapsed to represent all over 550 na tribal nations in the United States. Mm -hmm. and. There's a reason for that is because they're robust and beautiful. They're extremely gorgeous works of art. They're in almost every museum I've ever been in around the world, but they only represent a small section of the Northwest coast in Alaska or in Canada and the United States. So here in Oregon, that doesn't represent Oregon's tribal history. So I started doing this talk because I wanted people to have a visual story. What, are, what is that iconography? What does it look like? So this is just a glimpse and um, I wanted to show you, these are, this is at a festival that was on the waterfront when the Tillicum Bridge was opened. This is the Grand Ronde. These aren't ancient artifacts. They brought their canoes to celebrate the opening of the Tillicum Bridge. So you can see the consistency over two centuries of the Chinook canoe. And I love especially how I got this picture of them like against the white tents and you can just see so clearly. This is a piece of art by a Chinook Nation artist that's on the Tillicum Bridge. And so he's been studying uh, petroglyphs and um, uh, pieces of stone that were on Sovie Island, thousands and thousands of stone carved items were dug up and um, kind of creating a, an uh, iconography of Chinook Nation um, art. Uh, this is the canoe journey. So one way that Native people today in Oregon teach the children is they have the, one tribe will say, okay, we're meeting up um, in Astoria and all of the tribes will use the old Indian highways, which are the rivers, and have their kids make the canoes, carve the paddles, and then learn the navigation to get there. So it's a way of teaching that cultural history. Um, this shows the most adorable child, <laughs> so I thought that was beautiful. But also, we see the woven basketry hat. We see the designs on the woven basketry hat. Um, we see the dentalium shell um, necklace. Dentalium only grew on the, or was harvested on the west coast of Vancouver Island in Canada. It was a trade item. This is a Chinook um, piece of art on the Tillicum Bridge. She is Umatilla. This is an, an ancient artifact dug up at Sobe Island, probably the Chinook people. This is um, uh, Lillian Pitt, her sculpture at uh, Central Oregon um, Community College. And then these are baskets. Oh, this is um, uh, Pat Courtney Gold, a contemporary uh, Native American artist who's from uh, Warm Springs. And this is a, an antiquity 
uh, piece. So I just wanted to give you, since you're being asked to comment on what images you'd like to see on a mural, I just thought you'd like to see some of those images. So, um, thanks, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Yeah, I was going to say, do you want to take questions? Yes. Um, is there a way we can uh, see this slideshow after? So she's recording it, and it will be posted on my YouTube channel. So, yes. Um, and uh, that's why I included the page numbers from which book it was coming from. Um, I'm trying to refer you back to my books because that's where I'm using it. If there's no page number, it's research that ha I haven't published yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have any idea what was grown in the Chinese vegetable garden? What was primarily grown? So it, it was a lot of vegetables that were used by the, the big houses up around, it, you know, uh, the Chinese vegetable gardens, and also vegetables that were used in um, Chinese restaurants in, in Chinatown. So um, I have one slide where I've listed, made a list, and I forgot to include that, but. Um, it's it, it they were known for getting bumper crops of harvest off of a very very little amount of land mm -hmm. did they bring any uh you know starts from asia i don't know uh, but i would imagine since a lot of uh, the uh, produce used at uh, the chinese restaurants were would have been you know like bok choy doesn't come from here so like where do you get that i would imagine so mm -hmm. <clears throat> the reference to Slab Town, Stump Town, a little bit of background on those. Where they yes, sorry, I didn't go into that. So Stump Town was all of Portland, and it referred to this was a vast forest of very dense old growth trees. It was very expensive to hire the labor, probably of Native people, Chinese Americans, and then later on Irish Americans, uh, whoever would work for cheapest, uh, to cut the tree down in order to get this land available for putting a house up. It was ex extremely expensive to dig up the stump. So Stump Town was named as such because they painted the stump white so you wouldn't stumble across it and just left them there to rot. Uh, Slab Town was called that because when they were um, floating logs down the river to a lumber mill um, and all the rivers were used at, um, as a way logs float so it's a very uh, logical way to float logs to the lumber mill, you've got to cut off the rounded edge to make squared lumber. The rounded edges were then cut up and taken in carts. So you would see a horse-drawn or a donkey-drawn cart all over town taking the slab wood mm -hmm. to people's houses to be sold for, or, or to be used to heat their homes or to cook with. So what we now think of as Trendy 3rd or Northwest 23rd they said back then it was like you're walking down a canyon because there were so many stacks of slab wood stack left on the curb to, to dry out for later use that you couldn't even see beyond the curb. It was a bit of a class issue because the wealthy homes didn't have stacks of slab wood sitting out front. You know, they would have put it in the back or they hired somebody to chop it up and put it uh, in their basement or, or that sort of thing. So, um, all of Northwest Portland from the river to the hills was a place where blue collar immigrants went. They came and they would see Hotel Coty and they would know, oh, well, I'm Finnish. That word means home in, fin in Finnish. So I know I can stay there at that boarding house and they will cook the food I'm familiar with and they will speak my language. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, they made um, the clay um, uh, water pipes, they made bricks, they worked at the lumber yard. It was lots of hard working people. Mm -hmm. um, is there a, do you have a resource for where we could um, hear the Chinook gar garden? Yes, so the Chinook Nation has, um, uh, uh, I think a YouTube page and they have, um, they, they eagerly teach people. Um, so the, the version that was used um, in the 1850s had about 500 words. It was considered quite uh, simple to pick up. You know, most languages have far more. Um, so I believe they've added to it with like words that they need, but um, that's, that's your best source. Um, and um, the reason I pronounce it Chinook and not Chinook is that in every um, pioneer story that I've read, 
they put something like a TCH to indicate a harder sound there, not a softer sh sound. So um, that I know that people pronounce it differently, but that's why I pronounce it that way. Mm -hmm. That was what I wanted to ask okay. because I've never heard it pronounced any other way than the Chinook. Chinook, right, right. So um, the, the hard T indicates to me, if you spell something TCH and they spelled things phonetically, like you saw how they spelled Chinook canoe, they were just, it was not a standardized spelling. It was however it sounded to you. And when I've seen TCH too many times, I've, I've been like, I'm pretty sure that was a hard sound and not a soft sound, like a shh rather than, so people say Chinook, but um, the, a TCH to me would indicate a sh sound. So, mm -hmm. Do you talk to any tribal members? Here? Yeah, that, so the, the Chinook Wawa um, dictionary um, talks about some of those things. Mm -hmm. But like current tribal members, Right, the, the Grand Ron put out a current Chinook Wawa dictionary of the language as it's been used on the Grand Ron, because Grand Ron has over 30 tribes and they needed to talk to each other in a shared language. So for them, Chinook Wawa has been their, um, the, the language that they use more daily. So they've recently, like in the last five years, put out a revised Chinook Wawa dictionary that um, changes the phonetics in a way Yes. Thanks so much for sharing all the information, Tracy. So I'm wondering, um, the 100 acres mm -hmm. of um, land that was used for farming mm -hmm. by the Chinese Americans, Yes. were they just using it for free then? No, I'm, I'm pretty okay. sure that Mr. King, who Kings Hill is named after, rented the land. Oh. I have not found any evidence of how much, if they were taken advantage of and charged exorbitant rates, I don't know. I haven't found any uh, information about that. But they were definitely rented the land. And, and Mr. King was getting rent on land that nobody else would rent. Mm -hmm. Nobody's gonna rent that land right next to the Tanner Creek and get flooded out all the time. So he was making some money. So it wasn't charitable stuff that was happening here. So in your research, mm -hmm. in, did, did, did you find any information like what happened after they, you know, uh, found these land to be desirable and, you know, took, took over. Like what so, happened to the- Yes, so I have, trains? I don't have it in this talk, but in my history of Goose Hollow talk, I have, so that, that um, exposition building that was on Burnside, it burned in 1910, as did the old Multnomah Amateur Athletic Club clubhouse that was on 18th and many buildings nearby. They don't mention it in the newspaper articles, but I suspect that the Chinese shanties in the gulch that were clearly, you know, right there next to the, these things probably burned then too. And then I have pictures showing a complete massive reshaping of the terrain of the gulch right there. Uh -huh. And so they're, they're, they're moving land, they're leveling it out, um, they're making it more useful. And then the old version of the Mac was built. It was an old vine covered elegant building that was before this brutalist architecture <laughs> version over here. Same thing happened right where we're standing. So there was the Cam Estate and an orchard on this. So the Cam Estate was on a, a much higher mound uh, where the old Lincoln High School was, and it went into a steep gulch right here. So there was a massive amount of land that had to be reshaped just to get this ungulchy <laughs> and to bury the creek. So the creek runs under here. It runs uh, under that building. Um, and then uh, through the stadium, it makes a little um, kind of a U shape on the edge. When they were remodeling the stadium and add, adding um, seating on the 18th side, they had to straddle the heavy equipment over the Tanner Creek pipe hmm. so they wouldn't collapse it. So it, so it evened the weight distribution. Mm -hmm. So interesting because I, I've been involved in Old Town for Chinatown for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And whenever we talk about wanting to build, there's always this question about the water table mm -hmm. underground. So now what you said today mm -hmm. made a lot of sense mm -hmm. of, you know, all this uh, concern about parking, uh, you know, and, and going underground. I've heard but, that the buildings where they didn't build it like a bathtub with, you know, something to keep it away from the water, that the bottom, you know, like there may, may be three or four buried floors of parking and the bottom two floors will just be running streams of water mm -hmm. on a rainy day. Mm -hmm. 
So I would just say the architect needs to build a bathtub <laughs> around uh -huh. it. I, I don't think you can't build in it, but I think you just, they have to be creative. Got it. But, you know, a lot of Portland is built on fill and on infilled. So either a gulch that's been filled or a lake that's been, you know, the water piped out to the river and then it infilled. So I don't know if you've gone to the um, a rail heritage museum that's over by behind OMSI. It's very flat land. Doesn't look like you're on anything of importance. They had to put a hundred foot pile driving to reach bedrock there. It's sawdust. So so, so I um, I apologize. I'm no no no. Talking no. Out the but I know in 2017 a law was passed mm -hmm. in Oregon to require K-12 um, education to include ethnic studies. Mm -hmm. You know uh, so. So well, I've worked very much on that. Mm -hmm. um, so my problem is I could give this talk 100 times and yes. it would still not reach right. the public consciousness of, of Portland history. I've given this talk many, many times. That's why I'm so passionate. I'm like, please remember this. Please ask for this to be on the mural because people don't remember. So I've worked as a consultant. Oregon Historical Society was hired by Portland Public Schools to rewrite the third and fourth grade readers, which when my kids went through was just like all pioneers manifest destiny stuff and I'm very very happy to have been able to fit some of this story into this uh, not as much as I'd like but still it's going to be dramatically different than before um, and then I've also consulted with uh, my department I'm in curriculum and instruction at PSU so I've consulted with the teachers who train social studies teachers to make sure that they have the resources and it, I'm trying to write books as fast as I can, but the res we're having to cobble together some resources so that they can uh, hand it to them. So I should tell you that um, uh, on the notablewomenofportland.com website that my daughter and I did, I tell you how you can use that book to teach all of the requirements that the state showed. And then I thought, well, why am I consulting for curricula and instruction at PSU, why don't I just put those resources? So I will be adding those resources to notablewomenofportland.com. Um, uh -huh. um, I wanted to say that I'm in a US history class at Lincoln right now, mm -hmm. and we did start the year by talking about at least a little bit about this stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's made at least a little bit of a dent here at Lincoln. Mm -hmm. so, um, I, I appreciate that. that. Thank you. Well, it's not just me. There's a lot of people trying to get that that change, but um, I appreciate hearing that. Uh, it hasn't been the case for a long time, but I think it's changing. And did you have your hand up? No. You didn't? Okay. All right. Thank you so much. If you want to keep talking, I'll linger. I also have books for sale if you want to buy one. But this library has all the books. You can check it out. Thanks. Thank you.